Hey guys, I want to do a quick uh, book review and actually read some of the excerpts. I see a lot of um, reviews online where they don't read anything by the author. They're just kind of given their um, opinion of it. This is the second in the series uh, Recherche by um, Marcel Proust. And there's the cover where she's kind of looking wistfully uh, on her bed. I would imagine that's Albertine. But I love the quote at the top. It is marvelous, marvelously about life. And when people ask, like, why did you read all of Recherche du Temps Perdu? It's over 4,000 pages, um, way longer than, I mean, way longer than War and Peace. And the reason I did is is because um, it's just about life. Everything he writes about, it could be um, his struggle with insomnia, um, He's writing here about uh, neurotic people, and and he said it's not so bad to be uh, neurotic. These modern library classics are so great; they have like the perfect words per page. But he said, you know, it's the neurotic people that invent all the great things, uh, from music to religion. And he he talks about art in here and what it is about certain artists that you just love. And um, anyways, he's talking about neurotic people. I'm just going to read it. You might hear uh, the Great Dane in the background. Neurotic subjects are perhaps less addicted than any, despite the time-honored phrase, to listening to their insides. They hear so many things going on, by which they realize later that they are wrong to let themselves be alarmed, that they end by paying no attention to any of them. Their nervous systems have so often cried out to them for help, as though with some serious malady, when it was going simply going to start snowing, or they were going to move house, that they have acquired the habit of paying no more heed to these warnings than a soldier, who in the heat of battle perceives them so little that he is capable, although dying, of carrying on for, for some days still the life of a man in perfect health. One morning, bearing within me all my habitual ailments, from whose constant internal circulation I kept my mind turned as resolutely away as from the circulation of my blood, I came running blithely into the dining room when my parents were already at table and having assured myself as usual that to feel cold may mean not that one ought to warm oneself, but that for instance, one has received a scolding and not to feel hungry may mean that it is going to rain and not that one ought to fast. Had taken my place between them when in the act of swallowing the first mouthful of a particularly tempting cutlet, a nausea and dizziness brought me to a halt the feverish reaction of an illness that had already begun, the symptoms of which had been masked and retarded by the ice of my indifference. Um, and this is from uh, the second installment of In Search of Lost Time, although the first translation, Remembrance of Things Past, might sound more poetic to you. This is Within a Budding Grove, and um, he's kind of falling out of love with Gilbert, but it's probably because his love for her went kind of unrequited. And he's kind of saying when you're in love with someone, you kind of play this game, right? And uh, uh, he's still struggling with his uh, sleep and everything. He has these health conditions. But here's how he, he's struggling with kind of learning to let go, maybe, of Gilbert. And it's uh, before he's met Albertine. New Year's Day went by, hour after hour, without bringing me that letter from Gilbert. And as I received a few others containing greetings belated or retarded by the congestion of the mails in that season, on the 3rd and 4th of January 1st I, of January, I still hoped, but more and more faintly. On the days that followed, I wept a great deal. True, this was due to the fact that having been less sincere than I thought in my renunciation of Gilbert, I had clung to the hope of a letter from her in the new year. And seeing that hope exhausted before I had time to shelter myself behind another, I suffered like an invalid who has emptied his phial of morphia without having another within his reach. But perhaps also in my case, and these two explanations are not mutually exclusive, for a single feeling is often made up of a contrary element, elements. <clears throat> The hope that I entertained of ultimately receiving a letter had brought to my mind's eye once again the image of Gilbert, had reawakened the emotions which the expectation of finding myself in her presence, the sight of her, her behavior towards me, 
had aroused in me before. The immediate possibility of a reconciliation had suppressed in me that faculty, the immense importance of which we are apt to overlook, the faculty of resignation. Neurasthenics find it impossible to believe that friends who assure them that they will gradually recover their peace of mind, if they will stay in bed and receive no letters, read no newspapers. Um, to me, I can see why some people prefer the second book even to the first, um, which is Swan's Way. And I think it's because, although he is kind of pining away for Gilbert, and you might think that's sappy young love, you know, he's only, what, 16 in this book, so it takes place probably around the turn of the century, 1900s, um, maybe right before 1900. Uh, he's not very clear on it, but like, we, we figure the protagonist in this is Marcel, and, you know, he... He talks a lot more about um, not just his own inner thoughts. He, he goes into a lot of different topics that would interest you, like uh, art and music and good writing and, and what it means to even be a good painter. And um, so when you read this, you start going, okay, there's some extended prose. I don't tend to like the dialogue as much, but... The dialogue sometimes, depending on who he's talking to, can reveal uh, in a way how people criticized his writing at first and how hard it was for him to get published. Um, but, you know, Swan gives some of his ideas about art and what makes a good artist and how someone you might really like isn't really that impressive to other people. Um, Here's where Monsieur de Norpois is, is giving some of his opinions about life and art and politics. After launching this quotation, Monsieur de Norpois paused and examined our faces to see what effect it had upon us. This is page 44. I know I'm bouncing around. The effect was great, the proverb being familiar to us already. It had taken the place that year among the men of consequence of he who sows the wind shall reap the whirlwind. That's a reference to the Bible, which was sorely in need of a rest, not having the perennial freshness of working for the king of Prussia, quote unquote. For the culture of these eminent men was an alternating one, usually triennial. Of course, the use of quotations such as these with which Monsieur de Norpois excelled in sprinkling his articles in the review was in no way essential to their appearing sound and well-informed. Even without the ornament which the quotations supplied, it sufficed that Monsieur de Norpois should write it at a suitable point, as he never failed to do. Quote, the court of St. James was not the last to be sensible of the peril, or feeling ran high on the singer's bridge, where the selfish but skillful policy of the dual monarchy was being followed with anxious eyes, or a cry of alarm sounded from Monte Cristo yet again. That perpetual double dealing, which is so characteristic of the Ball Platts. By these expressions, the lay reader had at once recognized and acknowledged the career diplomat. But what had made people say that he was something more than that, that he was endowed with a superior culture, had been his judicious use of quotations, the perfect example of which, at that date, was still, give me a good policy and I will give you good finances, to quote the favorite words of Baron Louis. Um, we know that Proust's parents wanted him, at least his dad, who was a physician, wanted him to be a diplomat. But he didn't really enjoy legal classes or political classes. Unlike myself, I got my master's in political science. Um, but he was more interested in writing. And when he first tried to write, he felt hopeless at it. He wasn't that good. It felt forced. Um, he resigned in tears and he didn't really I, I don't think he wrote he began writing uh, this series until he was like 37 uh, and he died young at like 53 but there's Proust scholars to this day you know people at Cornell and Vassar you know who dedicate their lives to just reading not the Bible not Shakespeare Proust um, so he's just so eloquent um, it's hard to imagine him being anything else but a a writer, but apparently his dad um, 
kind of acquiesced to it. And, um, you know, Proust just went through so much pain with his constant illnesses that I think that's how he's able to write so profoundly is he's digging deep down and just he has a god-given gift for it uh as far as i can tell this is my second time reading through this book i'm about halfway about a third of the way maybe because there's notes at the end but um you know this one has been a little bit more interesting the second time uh and they say it's because you're attaching it to memory, you know, all of this volume, it's called In Search of Lost Time, you know, it's, it's kind of remembering, it's, it's, it's trying to get in touch with those memories. You know, I had a Proustian moment the other day, um, it wasn't with a Madeline, it was, uh, it was actually um, drinking, it sounds kind of funny, but I was drinking a, a 7-Up Zero, and it had cherry in it. And I was drinking it, and I was like, why is this kind of a, uh, it wasn't exactly a rapturous experience, but it was like, why am I a little happy right now? I mean, this tastes good, but I've I've had 7-Up before, and I, I remembered, oh, when I was a kid, I'd go out to eat with my parents and, you know, and my brothers and sister, I would normally get what was called a Shirley Temple, because they would take the Sprite and mix it with grenadine, which is like a cherry mix and and uh when i was a kid i didn't like that it was a it was a grenadine you know i wish or, or a shirley I, I wanted it to be called like a burt reynolds but it was called a shirley temple <laughs> but whenever i ordered it even when i was 12 i'd be like sprite and grenadine please um but it just reminded me of you know going out and and it was a proustian moment because it was tied to my memory of of childhood and i i think he just liked kind of the innocence um, how much your parents kind of cared for you. They, they weren't disappointed in anything you did yet. Um, uh, and it, it's just, you know, you're kind of a carefree person when you're a kid. You, do, you hopefully haven't had a lot of loss and depression or something set in, even if you're a thinker um, at that age. But, um, I mean, he could write about a pencil sitting on the table and he'll make it sound interesting because he'll relate it to a childhood memory or he'll expound on what it means to be a writer or he'll, he'll just tie it to something interesting and he can just elaborate profusely about it um you know these long sentences um but not long sentences in the way that maybe Kafka writes it's it's more like just beautiful ornately written prose and uh extended prose which is really awesome and i recommend reading pretty much anything by proust any of his uh seven installments in uh in search of lost time